with me. Okay, so um, thank you for that nice introduction. I'm so excited to be here with all of you and that I'm so excited to see in the chat that so many of you are excited to hear what I have to say. Um, that's super nice. So yeah, as you heard, I'm gonna tell you all about how technologists can make a difference in wildlife conservation. Um, I'm gonna start by telling you about um, one project specifically that I've been fortunate to get to work on. Um, and then I'll dive into a few uh, resources that you can also leverage if you're interested in working in this space as well. Um, and at the end, I'll have a whole list of resources to share with you. So don't worry about you know jotting things down. Um, and I won't be able to cover all the resources that I have, but I will share that list with you at the end. So let's get started. Um, so just a little bit about me before I jump in, which you heard a lot of this in the, the little bio um, that was read at the beginning, but um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about myself. So I have a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in computer science um, from Western Washington University. And now I live in Seattle, Washington um, with my partner. And I, aside from coding and uh, my day job sort of stuff, um, I really love hiking and camping and getting outside whenever I can, um, which does, that interest definitely does lend itself well to then having a lot of, you know, motivation in my work um, related to the planet and the environment. So I love that. And then I also love knitting. So I knit these two sweaters that I'm wearing in these pictures here and actually the sweater I'm wearing now. So um, just as a fun little story, uh, I've been watching a lot of Gravity Falls uh, through the pandemic, this cartoon, and this character, Mabel, she is a knitter and she knits all the sweaters she wears throughout the, the show. So my one of my latest projects was knitting Mabel's, one of her sweaters from the show. So that was a fun uh, project. <laughs> um, and then additionally, I do also get to spend a lot of time talking to audiences like you and also a lot of students um, all the way from like kindergarten through college students about the work that I do. And I find that it's so fun to get, um, you know, we can so easily, uh, you know, care about the wildlife side of things, kind of no matter who you are, what your interests are. Um, but then telling them that technology can be a way to have an impact in this space uh, can really start to open their minds to all the different options that are out there. So hopefully I can do that for you as well. Um, tell you a little bit about what the possibilities are for combining technology and wildlife conservation, because I certainly didn't know what those options were before I found this job. So uh, let's dive in. Um, a little bit about the company that I work for, just briefly. So um, I work for Vulcan, and soon all of uh, our technology, um, Earth-related technology projects at Vulcan are going to be transitioning into the Allen Institute for AI. So um, Vulcan was founded by Paul Allen and his sister Jody Allen um, as a way to a, a place where we were going to be uh, applying technology and uh, big thinking to address some of the biggest challenges in the world. So we focus on uh, conservation, climate change. We have an amazing climate modeling team, um, a lot of ocean health projects, and then some community related projects, community focused projects as well. Um, and so nothing's going to change with our projects as we move into into AI2. Um, we'll just be transitioning over there. And it's still all within the Allen family um, or, uh, umbrella of organizations. So um, that's just a note that we are going to be transitioning to AI2, um, but continue to still have the same mission and get to work on the same cool projects that I'm currently working on now. So um, if you're interested in, uh, we have a lot more projects going on than just what I'm going to be telling you about today. So um, if you're interested, you should look at Vulcan's website or AI2's website, um, or I can talk about that at the end if you're interested to learn more. So diving into uh, what does it actually look like to build technology for wildlife conservation? Um, a lot of the, or almost all the projects that I've worked on actually have had to do with something called a wildlife survey, which is a non-invasive method that scientists can use to study the animals that they are wanting to learn more about. Um, so they don't disturb the animals at all by using this method, which um, involves collecting a ton of data about the animal. So that can be uh, images that they're collecting, could be video footage, um, sound recordings is, a is getting more and more popular um, as a way to just 
learn more about animals out in their habitat, what's going on out there, and you can get a lot of really uh, amazing information from a wildlife survey. So you can learn things like uh, population size, you can learn about where animals are living, different, um, uh, what animals are living in different locations, uh, you can learn health information about the species and the individuals and the population, um, and more. So they're this really amazing tool, um, but one of the biggest challenges with the wildlife survey is you collect a lot, a lot, a lot of data, like hundreds of thousands of images, thousands of hours of video recording or sound recording. And then usually someone has to sit there and look through all the videos or listen to all the, the, the acoustic recordings um, and pick out whatever important information they're trying to pick out of those, that big pile of data. And this can just take a really, really long time. Um, and it's not the sometimes not task to have to do for thousands of hours. So um, what my team and I work on is applying machine learning to this problem and getting um, algorithms to automatically do parts of this not so exciting um, part of wildlife research so that we can save scientists time and allow them to just spend uh, their time and energy on the stuff that we really do need humans to be doing. Um, because wildlife researchers do amazing work and it's so important. Um, and so if we can save them time in one area, they can just, you know, amplify their work um, and do even more great stuff. So that's what we do kind of generally, but more specifically, um, I wanted to tell you about this one project, which is very um, close to my heart and close to me physically as well. Um, so. We've been working on this project related to the southern resident killer whales, um, which are a specific population of killer whales, and they live in the Salish Sea. And the Salish Sea happens to be right in my backyard, essentially. It's the water off the coast of Washington um, in the Puget Sound, all the way up into parts of Canada. And so um, the Salish Sea is, yeah, right in my backyard, and these whales spend a large majority of their year in the Salish Sea. Um, and so there are lots of different uh, populations of killer whales kind of all over the world, but these ones in particular are very, um, a, a lot of groups are working really hard um, to protect this specific population because they are so endangered. There are only 75 individuals left in this population. And um, so a lot of people are working really hard to increase those numbers and kind of some of the factors that are affecting them uh, the most are, um, first of all, they live in a very vessel traffic heavy area. Um, you can imagine like the water off of the coast of Seattle um, is there's a lot of ship uh, shipping activity and all kinds of stuff happening out in that water. And so um, along with waters all over the place, a lot of marine mammals are experiencing this um, this factor, but uh, those ships create a lot of noise and there's just a lot of um, traffic that the whales have to kind of contend with um, and the noise and the stress can cause a lot of stress, um, which can impact them negatively health-wise. Um, they also only eat salmon, uh, preferably Chinook salmon, they're picky eaters. And so um, the Chinook salmon used to be much bigger and there used to be a lot more of them. And so the whales have a hard time finding enough food to eat. Um, and then the third thing is just ocean pollution in general and toxins in the water um, because killer whales are a top predator in the food chain. Um, as you move up the food chain, the toxins build up more and more in those animals that are higher in the food chain. And so um, they just have more toxins in their bodies and um, that can also, as you would imagine, impact their health negatively. So with this project, um, we are very lucky to get to work with researchers at Sea Life Response Rehabilitation and Research, which is another um, organization that's in the Pacific Northwest. And they have been studying these specific whales for many years now. Um, and they do that by flying a drone out over the water. And they take these amazing pictures like this one that you saw on the previous slide. Um, and from these pictures, they, do, they use a technique called photogrammetry, which is literally just taking measurements from a photo. Um, and they can uh, do specific measurements along the bodies of each individual in a picture. And that through those measurements, they can estimate and understand the health of that individual. 
So it's this really awesome technique that they use um, and super, you know, non-invasive. They don't have to go near the whales. They don't have to do, you know, any poking or prodding of the whales and they can basically do a health checkup just through these photos. So it's really amazing stuff that they're able to do. Um, and you can kind of see here uh, some of the, the idea of the measurements that they take kind of all down the body um, to estimate the condition of the body. And one of the things specifically that they're measuring for is something called peanut head syndrome. So this is the same whale and her picture was taken in three different years. And visibly, you can obviously see she's gotten much skinnier as time has gone on. Um, but what you can also start to see is signs of peanut head, which is where the whale starts to lose fat behind their eye patches, um, these white patches on their head. And as they lose fat there, their head literally starts to become like, shaped like a peanut. Um, and so with the measurements that the scientists are doing, they are specifically measuring for, um, I guess they're specifically measuring for a lot of things, but additionally measuring for signs of peanut head, because that can be a sign that the whale is declining in health. So, um, but then additionally, in more happy sort of news, they can also measure for um, things like pregnancies and they can track pregnancies through this method as well. So that's a little bit more happy um, and exciting to see. <laughs> So where does my team come in? Um, this is uh, my team, the team that's been working on this project, at least across the top of the screen here. Um, and we've been specifically working uh, very closely with Dr. Fernbach at SR3. Um, and she's, so she's one of the marine mammal researchers. And what we have been working on is helping her address, again, one of the big challenges of the wildlife survey, which is that it just takes a really long time um, to look through all of the data that you collect in a survey. So uh, Dr. Fernbach and her team, when they go out and fly the drone, in a given day, they might take 2,000 photos, up to 2,000 photos. So um, that's, that's a lot of images. Even if you just had to look through those 2,000, that would take a while. But um, if they fly, you know, almost every day for a month, then processing all of the images from one month of flights takes anywhere from four to six months just to process them and actually get to those health assessment numbers at the end. So what my team and I have worked on for about the last year and a half is building them um, a piece of software that they can use, um, a machine learning platform that will automatically do some parts of this health assessment um, gathering process and save them hopefully a lot of time in the end. Um, and we're hoping to go from uh, six months down to six weeks, and then hopefully eventually down to six days. Um, and so that's the goal. And uh, Dr. Fernbach and her team have just started using the tool. So we're still, um, you know, measuring how, how much time we're saving them and, and continuing to improve the tool. Um, but that is the goal at the end of the project. So one of the things that, um, I, that I've been specifically working on for this tool is creating machine learning algorithm that will automatically recognize which whales are in each image um, because one of the parts of the health assessment process is they have to identify the whales in each image and find the best pictures of each whale in uh, from the huge batch of images. So, you know, they're not down there just like perfectly posing for us, but we do to do the measurements, the whales need to be super flat um, in the water and also not have any like splashing or anything um, sort of obscuring their body outline. So uh, identifying them is a big part of this process. And so I usually use this slide with um, younger students, but it's still, I think, a fun little activity to do. So how we identify the whales is by looking at their saddle patch on their back. So it's this heart shaped sort of patch here. And the patterns on that saddle patch are unique to each individual. So you can um, identify if you're an expert, which uh, Dr. Fernbach certainly is, um, you can look at the saddle patches and know who is in each image. Um, but uh, so that's how I've also taught the computer to recognize who is who. So you all can uh, become the marine mammal researchers now and take a look at this picture on the left and guess who you think. I see some guesses in the chat already. So you're already you're on top of this. Guess who you think it is, though, between these four um, options here. And three, two, one, I'm going to reveal it. Okay. Yes. So I saw a lot of guesses for a clip. So you were all 
very correct. Good work. Um, and so how I've gotten, uh, I've set up the algorithm to do this is I'm using something called a Siamese network. And uh, it basically can compare two images and um, tell you, are these two images the same individual or are they two different individuals? So we compare each new image to a known image of each individual in the population. And uh, the closer to one, the that the model the, that the number that the model spits out is, um, the more similar it thought those two images were. So for Calypso, 0.96, very close to one, it thought that these two pictures of Calypso were very similar, which it was correct in this case. So good to see. Um, but how we actually set this up for the scientists to be able to use um, is we are really wanting to use like a human in the loop sort of um, setup where we're not having the, the machine learning make any final decisions. Um, and so how we set it up is we will show, or the, the scientists will have a new image they're trying to identify. Um, we can show them this uh, grad cam is the technique that I use to display this visualization, which is showing which pixels in the image were the most important to the computer's decision about who it was. And so it's highlighting the saddle patch, which is a really good sign. It's looking at a a significant feature for identification. Um, and then we'll spit out the top five guesses from the computer so that the scientists can make the final decision. Um, and in this case, actually, the computer's top guess, L55, was correct. So that's that's good. But um, our, our model in the end, uh, about 80% of the time, it does put the correct individual in the top five guesses. So um, we're still working on improving this and trying out some new architectures in addition to the Siamese network. Um, to see if we can get some better results so uh so that we can yeah be more sure of the computer's uh responses and predictions so it's been a really fun problem though to think about and to work on um and just quickly i guess yeah we have time for this so um i wanted to also just show you what the tool looks like so this is um the first version of the tool um, this is just the machine learning portion of the tool so we've kind of split it into two portions and i'll show you the second portion after this, um, which is a more, uh, it's a plugin into ImageJ, which is the tool that the scientists already use to do their measurements. So we kind of split the machine learning out um, for this sort of proof of concept version of what we're building for them. Um, so it's just in this Jupyter notebook that I made, all the machine learning models will kind of run um, and churn for a while so the scientists can step uh, then they can come back and start reviewing the machine learning models results. Um, so again, like I said, they'll be shown uh, for each image that the model, we do have a model in there that's determining whether or not this image is identifiable um, or predicting whether. So we'll show them all the model determined identifiable images and the top five uh, predictions for who it likely is and can make a final determination of who they think it is. They can like rotate these images and um, to be shown the next five options if they don't see the correct one in the top five. Um, yeah, so let's see, I'll skip ahead a little bit here. And then the model will also, or the, the, the tool can do some sort of sequencing um, calculations based on location in the images and any identifications that were confirmed by the scientists uh, it can kind of fill in the gaps in a sequence of images, um, uh, adding some more identifications without the scientists having to explicitly approve each one in a sequence. So that's what it's showing here. It's adding IDs to additional um, detections of whales in the images. And then it will start to show the user um, different images that the model believes it, uh, to be measurable. So any images where we think a measurement could be taken from this image. Um, and how it determines that is by uh, finding different landmarks in the image. And so it can detect things like the blowhole, the eye patches, the dorsal fin um, root, which is like the spot where the dorsal fin meets the back, um, and the tail notch. And depending on how many different it found, it can makes a determination of like, this is probably measurable or probably not. And if the user agrees that it's measurable, it'll get copied to a folder of that individual's measurable images. Um, 
And then this is something we're still kind of experimenting with, but we are hoping to use those landmark detections like the snout and the dorsal fin to then project those measurement lines onto the body um, for the user to then refine later on in our second part of the tool. And then uh, in this part, they can just enter some additional metadata uh, for each image. So that's kind of what that part of the tool looks like, just the machine learning portion. And then this is the uh, plugin that we've built to ImageJ, which again is the tool that the scientists already use to do their measurements. And so um, via a CSV file, we can load the machine learning results into user to refine even more. So this is kind of what that side looks like. Um, they can open an image and load in a CSV for this set of images. Um, they can make comments. They can input the animal's ID and their and, and metadata that wasn't already loaded in a CSV. Just skip ahead a little bit because the most exciting part is being able to um, actually do these measurements. So they can input these landmarks um, or the machine, if the machine learning side already um, generated those, it will be projected onto the image and they can kind of move those around to be in the correct spot. And then it will project these guides onto the well so that the user then just, uh, this is what, these are the, the important measurements uh, at 5% intervals down the body, they wanna get the width of the animal. So the user can just place those endpoints instead of having to figure out where 5% intervals are down the body. Um, and they can also do, let's see, skipping ahead, some measurements um, where the, the tool will help them if a measurement like this one is, uh, is related to multiple different um, landmarks on the animal. So this one is, sorry, the 75% one is related to the top and the bottom of each eye patch. And so the, the tool can kind of project those more complicated measurements onto the body as well if it has the landmarks to go off of. Um, so that's kind of what the tool looks like at this point. We're hoping some next steps, um, not hoping, some next steps definitely are to um, eventually open source the tool so that more researchers can use it. We're expanding to more um, species as well. And uh, also, we're going to be incorporating the machine learning models into the actual UI interface so that it isn't such a two-step process. Um, we hope to make it more of an incorporated tool as we keep working on it. So a lot of exciting stuff to come for this tool. And we're super excited to get to keep working with SR3 and um, possibly some other researchers as well. So now I wanted to go into um, what can what can you do? So um, there's, you know, Vulcan and AI2 uh, do have open positions. So just wanted to plug that as well. If you are interested in working on um, projects like the one I just described, um, we do have open positions. And um, I think once we move to AI2, there will be positions related to wildlife conservation and our projects at Vulcan. Um, as they shift into AI2. So keep an eye out for that. That's happening in September. Um, but additionally, I wanted to call out some organizations and some volunteer activities as well. Um, in case, you know, you're not looking to switch jobs, there are still ways you can contribute to the wildlife conservation field, you know, using your amazing skills in technology. Um, so first, I wanted to call out um, Wild Me which is an organization that I've been really lucky to get to learn from this team a lot um, and work a little bit with them. And they really focus on, um, they have this platform called Wild Book, which they've applied to a number of species at this point to be able to use the patterns that to um, identify individuals in the species. For whale sharks, you can see on the left, they've done it for zebras. they have a number of other species as well. Um, and it's, uh, they work really closely with a lot of different scientists um, and have built this really amazing platform. And they also have uh, the opportunity, their, their, their platform is open source. So if you're interested in contributing um, on like a more volunteer basis, they also have that option. 
Um, I don't know if they have any open positions at the moment, but keep an eye on them for sure if you're interested because they uh, do really, really great work. Um, another kind of moving into the more volunteer opportunities realm, um, I do have more actual organizations that hire people <laughs> in my resource list that I'll share at the end. Um, but I volunteer opportunities. So Orca Sound is a really cool organization. Um, they have a completely open source platform uh, um, hook up to like our microphones that are out underwater. Um, they have hydrophone stations in a few different locations that are listening for orcas. And so their platform uses some bioacoustics and machine learning to automatically you know, flag different sounds that might be heard. But also people can listen to uh, the hydrophones live and sort of flag different things that they hear. So you can contribute on that end of things or you can get involved with them and um, work on their platform in an open source fashion. So um, they are doing some really cool stuff as well. Check that out for sure. Um, and then one of my favorite platforms uh, for uh, citizen science and data annotation is Zooniverse, um, which they have a, a huge number of projects up on their, their platform where anybody, any age, any, any skill level can um, annotate images for different scientific projects that are happening. So there's, um, these are a few of, uh, so this is um, from Snapshot Yeti, and they have camera traps, um, just cameras, you know, at ground level in all different locations, um, collecting images across the Serengeti. Um, and you, so you can go on and try to identify the animals that are seen in these camera trap images. Um, and they'll kind of help you narrow it down based on like pattern and color and how many horns it has and things like that. Any age, again, I've done this with kids before. It's like a really fun activity to do. And directly contributing to science, you know, these annotations are actually used to, um, you know, further conservation. So it's a really cool way for anyone to contribute. Um, this one on the right is, it was called uh, Cosmological Jellyfish. So apparently in, you know, there's a lot of space projects on, on Zooniverse too. And apparently if um, a galaxy looks like a jellyfish, something with the gas and like different legs will sort of appear that look like a jellyfish, that is relevant to um, what these scientists are studying. So um, for this one, you just indicate, does this a uh, galaxy look like a jellyfish, yes or no. Um, so that one is also fun. And there's like projects um, related to history, related to literature, um, all kinds of nature, um, conservation projects, a lot of space projects. Um, so kind of anything you're interested in, you can probably help annotate some data in that space on Zooniverse. So check that out for sure. And hopefully someday we will have a project on Zooniverse. We're hoping, um, we're starting a project related to bottlenose dolphins and recordings of bottlenose dolphins. Um, so we're hoping to maybe have a citizen science aspect of that project um, and helping to listen to dolphin whistles. So um, if you're interested in that, keep an eye on Zooniverse for that. There is a dolphin whistle one on there already I saw, but that one's not ours. So you can help with dolphin whistles already. Cool. So. Um, just wanted to close it out by saying again, thank you so much for attending. Um, I just hope that this inspired you some ideas um, for ways that you can already directly contribute to wildlife conservation research um, or, or some, some ideas for maybe shifting your career path if you're interested. Um, and again, if you scan this QR code, that will get you the full Google Doc of different resources and communities to join that are in the conservation and technology space. Um, a bunch of organizations that already build amazing conservation technology um, and then more open source and volunteer opportunities. So check that out if you're interested. It's also in the chat right now, it just got posted in the chat. Directly get the link that's in there. Um, and then also if you're interested in connecting, um, if you are interested in conservation technology, we should definitely connect. So feel free to add me on LinkedIn. Maybe just when you, uh, you know, try to connect, just add a little note in there that you were at this talk and um, I'll happily connect with you. 
then Twitter and Instagram, feel free to reach out on there as well. Um, I post things about projects from time to time, but also follow Vulcan and AI2 um, on social media if you want to really keep tabs on all the cool projects that are happening um, there. So thanks again for uh, listening and for attending. I'm so excited to get to have shared all this with you. And I'm excited to also share your questions. So I'll, I guess I'll leave this up so you can scan QR codes. And, um, but thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, Gracie. It was really wonderful. And I think people are already loving it. You can see in the chat that they enjoyed the <laughs> talk very much. And we have a bunch of questions as well. So uh, let's start with our first question. Uh, Molly Merkinson, I'm sorry if I pronounce your name incorrectly. Um, do forgive me. So Molly is asking, do fin shadows increase your matching error? Do what was that again? Fin shadows increase your matching error. I think oh, it was fin shadows. Like yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, that I I so I haven't done any like you know specific looking into this, but I have noticed just you know generally that if a shadow is in a specific spot where it kind of makes it look like someone else's uh, saddle patch, yeah, I think that definitely has an impact. Um, hopefully, you know, not too much of an impact, but. That, that, that would be something to look, uh, something interesting to look more specifically into to see um, what the actual impact is. But yeah, just generally, I have noticed that that can cause errors for sure. OK, so uh, next question is from Audrey Cook. Uh, this, lo this looks like a fun project. Do you know <laughs> any of uh, uh, any kind of open source opportunities that help uh, with wildlife conservation? Yeah. So if you look at that um, document, I put some of there. I also wanted to mention if those of any other additional resources that should be added to this list. I'm like more than happy to add additional um, information here. And I want to keep this list going and growing. So um, let's see, there was, I found a cool, uh, so there was one like open tree map. That was a the cool one that I found that they're doing some like crowdsourced tree inventory, tree mapping sort of stuff. Um, so that was a cool one I found more in the like, I guess, climate change space than like directly conservation related. Uh, but yeah, Orca Sound is an awesome one. Conservation X Labs, they have a bunch of open source conservation tech projects that they are working on all the time. So out for sure too um and then there are also kaggle competitions that you can uh anyone can participate in so that's where you uh compete with other people to build the best machine learning model for some task where uh that someone needs help with so there's often some conservation related challenges on kaggle as well um to yeah so there's a lot of opportunity an exhaustive list. So if you're interested, I would say Google around, see what's out there um, in your specific interest area. OK, so Steph is asking, how long did the machine learning tool take to develop? Yeah, so um, we've been working on it for about a year and a half at this point. Um, out of that, you know, it, we're, we're a small team, so <laughs> we were um, kind of divided among a lot of tasks. And so now I feel like that we have a platform, you know, out there that we've like kind of shown that our pipeline of steps and every and our different models like work <laughs> on a basic level. Um, now we're really able to like dive in and really refine things and improve things. Um, so we're still still working on it, but um, the bulk of the development has happened in the last probably like year or so. Yeah. So we have a next question from Brandy Hussman. Uh, I would like to know if you're using uh, supervised or unsupervised ML. And if it doesn't, it, do it first. first. Are you cut out there for a second? It's probably my internet. Um, but I oh. did hear the first part, so, which. Uh, okay. Which question was this? OK, uh, it's from Brandy. And Brandy. I, I can repeat the question if you want. 
uh, are you that using supervised yeah. or unsupervised uh, <laughs> machine learning and what about the libraries you're using this ah, is okay such yeah yeah we are using supervised learning for this project um since the this research has been going on for so long you know they already had a ton of images labeled with who you know different individuals already done um we had to go through and do some additional annotation internally um to like label you know for detection purposes we had to like put bounding boxes around animals in a bunch of images and um label the different landmarks on the animal so that we could train a model to look for blowholes and dorsal fin roots and stuff um so we had to do some annotation for sure uh but but then yeah did use supervised methods in the end It'll be interesting, actually, the next sort of one of the next things we need to tackle is how do you deal with um, a new individual in the population? So like if a new baby is born, how do we add them into the model? Um, so we might look into some more maybe unsupervised sort of methods for that with like clustering or something um, that won't be as necessary for this population because they, each individual is pretty well known um, at this point. But for bigger populations where you know, there are more unknown individuals, it might be better to take a more unsupervised approach. Um, and then the libraries I used to create the models. So um, using Keras largely, I use a lot of OpenCV for um, different image manipulation stuff. Um, and yeah, I don't feel like I use, I'm trying to think, I don't feel like I use any like super um, niche libraries or anything, just kind of general machine learning libraries that are available out there for free. So, um, yeah, feel free to ask more specifically if you want more information though, or like reach out. I'm happy to talk more about it. Yeah. Okay. So moving on to our next question from Veena Panduvinata. Um, what is the most difficult challenge in this project? Do you have any requirements to take the pictures? For example, the light should be limited to a number or how long the period to collect the pictures as a model? Yeah, a lot of great questions. Um, so I would say the most difficult part of most of our projects is not even like the technical aspects of the project, because um, I feel like those will get worked out in the end, you know, um, but just the, the communication part, you know, like we uh, have an amazing UX designer on our team, Jenna, and she has worked so hard to um, talk to our scientist partners all the time, like so frequently and make sure they're in the loop on everything um, and that we're really iteratively designing this with them because they are obviously the ones who are going to use it. They're the experts. Um, they they know so much more about the, the process of photogrammetry and everything so much more than we do. So making sure our communication streams were very open and like that we were listening all the time and not just jumping to, you know, oh, we think this will work. Like, let's just do this. Like we had to really take a step back and make sure we were um, having a super collaborative design process. And um, that was a challenge just because like, you know, communication is hard, but we have like, SR3 has been an amazing partner in this. So um, it wasn't, it wasn't like as, yeah, it went really well, um, I think. And, but that's just been a, a big learning process for me, for sure. It's just figuring out how much communication really is necessary to build something that is gonna work in the end for the scientists that we are building for. So um, that was, yeah, that was probably the most difficult part. Um, do you have any requirements to take the picture, for example? Okay, so, um, Kind of some of that is worked out for us. So a lot of the times they, so when they fly the drone to take the pictures, they only fly on clear days. So um, a lot of the light aspects and stuff were kind of kept consistent for us just because of the nature of how they do the research. Um, so that was kind of nice. Uh, we did some image manipulation with like brightening up images um, just so we can see the saddle patch and the actual body. Um, so we're doing some stuff like that, but uh, we don't really have like a hard limit on any um, aspects of the image like that because they just, they happen to all be pretty, pretty good in terms of light. Um, and then how long a period to collect the images as a model? Um, 
So the, the sign, I'm not sure if this is what you're asking, but uh, the scientists will generally fly the drone um, in like specific months out of the year that tend to have nicer weather. So they'll kind of fly for every, almost every day for a whole month. And then we just, use, we've just used whatever pictures they, they were able to give us, which was um, a, a huge number of pictures. So um, yeah. I don't know if that answered that last question, but um, feel free to, to ask again if I didn't didn't quite get it. <laughs> um, well, another great question from Cat Scott. How does Vulcan partner with conservation organization? Is there um, outreach or their preferred partner? Um, I think that's the question. I'd live, I would uh, live to get my student involved and with more conservation there. So that's from yeah. Cat Scott. Yeah, um, a great question again. Uh, so I feel like it kind of it varies from project to project, kind of how we get connected with different organizations. Um, we have some internal resources, in, people who work at Vulcan who are very like well connected in the conservation space. You know, they are conservation professionals, and so they often know organizations who they will connect us with or um, some projects have really come about more like organically where someone will reach out to us or we will find out about their research and reach out to them um, or if they're like doing something similar to uh, something we're already doing then we might reach out to them to see if they want to also use what we've built so there's a lot of different ways that it kind of happens um, but yeah we could talk more if you wanted or I could probably get you in touch with someone who knows more about uh, how those partnerships develop. But it's been really cool actually, because recently as the employees, we've gotten a lot more opportunities to like suggest new projects and to find new partners um, and to bring ideas forward. And so that has been really fun and exciting. Um, but a lot of times they're like local sort of um, organizations. And so uh, conservation in the Pacific Northwest is a big focus of Vulcan and so yeah, it's often they're local, and so we get connected that way. Yeah, there's kind of a lot of different ways that it happens. Okay, so next next question is from Stephanie Moore. Um, do they do more than wildlife conservation? What, you know, anything yeah. other than wildlife conservation? Yeah, we, um, so I see you said you have a BS in forest resource conservation, so that's awesome. Yeah, we, um, yeah, yeah, we do more. We definitely have more projects than just conservation. Yeah, we have like um, our climate modeling team, like I mentioned briefly. We have, there might be some projects more in like the forest space that are spinning up here in the future. Um, we don't necessarily have any like active forest related or forest research management sort of related ones, but that's definitely like on our radar. And I don't think we've, it, it's not like it's out of scope for us. It's just that those a project like that hasn't really come about yet. So um, yeah, we maybe maybe check back soon and then maybe we'll have a project that's more in your in your area of interest uh, in the future. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so our next question is from Tiffany R. Um, uh, she would like to develop a small portfolio project using an existing Kaggle ML data set of cats. So do you have any recommendation regarding how to get started with developing a very simple ML or slash Python model for her portfolio? Yeah, oh my gosh, um, that's awesome that you're just like gonna pick a, a data set and get started. That's like the best way, just experimenting and actually like getting in there and building it. That's like the best way to learn for sure. Um, so I think I, I, I'm always, I, I feel like I should uh, have some more resources off the top of my head because I get asked this question, um, or I've been asked this question a number of times and I never can like throw resources out there like you should take this course or something. But I have found that just like Googling around, um, there are some really great tutorials out there probably for building, uh, you know, specific, definitely there are a lot of cat machine learning uh, tutorials out there. So, um, following one of those could be great. Um, I know there are like Coursera courses that um, other people I know have taken that they have really liked in machine learning. So maybe just take an intro to machine learning like online course of some kind, that could be really helpful. But I say, yeah, just go for it. Find something that looks like it's, you know, 
understandable to follow and then and then just try it out and if it doesn't work then try another one there's so many resources out there um so that's awesome though that you're you're going for it i think that's great <laughs> So uh, our next question is from Sarah Whelan. If the whale gets much skinnier, is it is this still able to identify individual whales over time using the saddle patches? Yeah, um, that's a great question. We, you know, we've only been working on this for a little while and we only really have data from the last two years that we're using. Um, so we haven't necessarily had a, a chance to like dive into that sort of stuff. Like, you know, as the whale ages, like especially um, as the whale goes from a baby into a full grown whale, I think that's where a lot of our challenges with identifying saddle patches will probably come from. Cause when they're really young, their saddle patch is just kind of fully gray, um, kind of mottled gray. And then as they grow up, they'll kind of, it'll change into that more white um, with a distinct sort of pattern on it. So that change, I think, will require us to probably, you know, change the data set, retrain models, maybe, um, to include more recent pictures of, of individuals. So for, yeah, if a whale gets much skinnier, that also might be, uh, we might have to retrain the model um, in that instance as well. Uh, so yeah, that's a, a great, great thought. <laughs> So I think we are ahead of time. So we'll just take two last questions. Okay. So our second last question is from Beck Simpson. Um, he's questioning about the software. Did you use the notebooks to train the models to or just deploy for inference? Um, we, let's see, I guess I didn't really use a notebook to train them. Um, I just had some like Python scripts, but uh, no reason why I couldn't have used a notebook. Yeah. To train them. Um, yeah, just using them for inference at this point. And our last question for today, we have Laurie Hannon uh, asking, uh, what technical stack are you using? OS, DevTools, Cloud, etc. Yeah, I. Uh, so we are not quite even to that point to like have a super <laughs> well-defined stack or anything where, um, yeah. So I don't even really have an answer to that question, but um, can report back soon. Hopefully we'll have, we're bringing more people onto the project. So we're gonna like start developing in a more um, productionalized manner. We've mostly been really just doing like prototyping and like research sort of development. Um, but yeah, soon we will have very well-defined stack, I'm sure. And uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I think we have done many questions now, and I'm very so I'm very sorry. We are just you know shortage of time due to shortage of time. We can't quite answer every question. So if any questions uh, are still due, you can uh, send them to Gracie personally on LinkedIn, or uh, you know just chat chat with her via any email ID or anything else she want to share. Um, and thank you very much for our lovely audience. You were really great today. And thank you, Gracie, for being so informative, so amazing. And even I enjoyed, you know, I was uh, very much intrigued by your work. And I couldn't focus on the work I have to do backstage. <laughs> <laughs> so it was so okay. great. <laughs> thank you so much. No, you were amazing. And amazing moderator. Love, <laughs> thank you so much. And do check out our expo and networking tabs. Uh, we see you there. I, maybe we guys meet on networking. Yeah. So Grace, yeah, I'll see any, you any thoughts? There. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Reach out if you have more questions, for sure. Yeah. Talk to you soon. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Bye.